But yeah, Todd also stole my story I was about to share about um, uh, <laughs> my story about the sermon this morning. So he made it sound a little bit like I was quite reluctant to share. Um, and I, not that, you know, I just want to bring a bit of clarity. Um, it's not that I'm reluctant to, um, which is the bit I thought I'd be most scared of. But um, <laughs> earlier in the week, I just had this sense that I was supposed to preach. But I was like, but I have absolutely nothing like not even the first thought of what we're supposed to preach on. I'm like, well, it's all in good God saying I need to preach, but you need to tell me what I'm preaching on. And um, and I got nothing. And I was asking really specifically multiple mornings, like, come on, God, I, you know, if this is what you want me to do, that's fine. But give me a clue, throw me a bone, anything. And um, anyway, so on the way home from work, after quite a busy day on Friday, <laughs> feeling slightly frazzled on the park and ride bus of all things, um, God spoke to me quite clearly, so it was very interesting to find out that. And, I, and I, I literally, as I was pulling up in the driveway, I said to God, "Right, I'm going to go in, and I'm going to hope that Todd's had this amazingly inspirational day, and he's going to have written a sermon, and I'm off the hook." Um, because you know, a thought that you have on a park and ride bus is not a sermon; <laughs> it's a thought on a park and ride bus. <laughs> and, um, and I got in, and Todd's like, "Yeah, I've got nothing." <laughs> I'm like, no. No, that's not the answer. So, um, please bear with me if this is a little, or if it comes across a bit disjointed. Um, and I'm going to say it's quite hard. Hmm? Got some signal for a minute. Um, it's quite hard preaching from pieces of paper without anything to put them on. So if I'm a bit cack-handed, um, and I, need, I just don't need the wind to blow and throw everything. So, um, today I'm going to be talking about being your best self. Um, which is a bit of an interesting phrase, but we'll come to that a little bit later. So as I said on Friday, I was coming on my normal journey. I used Mill Park and Ride um, to go to and from um, work. And on Friday, I was coming home from work on the Park and Ride bus, as usual. And while on the bus, I overheard a conversation between two women who'd bumped into each other. Um, and it transpired that they'd obviously not seen each other for quite a long time, um, but they seemed to have quite a quite a healthy relationship they'd obviously known each other for quite a while but they'd obviously not seen each other since the beginning of the pandemic so the conversation as you would quite imagine quickly turns to how they'd both been doing through the covid pandemic and then i heard both of them make some really interesting statements one of them says we've all aged a lot in the past 18 months and then the other lady said a little bit later we are alive so i guess that's something and I was completely struck by that conversation. And it sounds terrible. It wasn't, it's not hard on the park and ride bus to hear a conversation. <laughs> not, many, not that many people talk to each other, especially at the moment. I was really struck by the negativity in their conversation. And I just thought, actually, I really do think that that actually echoes a wider feeling of lots of people. And certainly not by any means everybody. Um, but I think there's an underlying negativity that's come that actually a lot of people can at least identify with part of. What was interesting is that neither of these women were of an age where they had one foot in the grave, for lack of a better phrase. And from the little conversation it had, they had, it didn't sound like either of them had actually had COVID or had lost a family member or close friend to COVID. So their attitude is another reason why their attitude really got my attention. Now I want to be very clear here, COVID-19 is a terrible virus which has caused huge amounts of pain, destruction, death and sickness with consequences that we will be living with for many years to come. And for those that lost loved ones, it's horrendous, dreadful and leaves them with a huge void in their lives. However, we've said this again before and we will say it again, God was not and is not surprised by COVID-19. He didn't wake up in March 2020 from this big slumber, surprised by what was unfolding around the world. He wasn't asleep, he wasn't missing or not paying attention. He knew it was coming. And while he did not cause it, he also didn't stop it. And you know, we're not the first or last people to complain to God or believe that somehow he missed something or wasn't paying attention. You just have to read Job to see the nice debate that Job, for lack of a better word, that Job has with God throughout. But this is great quote in Isaiah, and I can only imagine what was going on in the culture for Isaiah as the prophet to have this message. 
and it's in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31, and I'm reading it from the message version. It says, why would you ever complain, O Jacob, or whine, Israel, saying, God has lost track of me. He doesn't care what happens to me. Don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. God lasts. He's creator of all. He's creator of all you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out. He doesn't pause to catch his breath. And he knows everything inside and out. He energizes those who get tired, gives fresh strength to dropouts. For even young people tire and drop out. Young folk in their prime stumble and fall. But those who wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. It's getting really complicated. God's word is true before, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's before it's even a mere memory. So I want to ask you all a question, and it's a question I'm asking myself as well. Are you like the women on the bus who came across as beaten down and wounded by all that has gone on in the past 18 months, feeling disillusioned, unmotivated, discouraged, depressed? Do you feel like you've aged exponentially? Do you feel like, well, I'm alive, so I guess that's something. Maybe you think that's all a little extreme and you're not there at, at all in your thinking, but that something else might cause you to feel that way. It doesn't have to just be COVID. I'm using that as an example. Or maybe you're somewhat there in your thinking. You've had some maybe sort of fleeting thoughts of that air in that direction. You know, we've all said it. Well, the last 18 months has changed a lot, hasn't it? And there's, there's a fine line, obviously, between reflecting on stuff that's gone on and allowing it to overcome you. So while I was researching the sermon, I found this amazing quote. It said, am I really living my best life according to God? Or am I delusional and living beneath whom God has created me to be? And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. Because what struck me when I heard that conversation on the bus was the sadness I felt for those women. That their life essentially amounts to very little. Where when the breath in your life, you're alive, is the best you have. That breaks my heart. Absolutely breaks my heart. And, you know, we can say, well, that's because, you know, well, maybe they weren't Christians. Although, ironically, I did overhear them say, you know, oh, you remember me from church? So I don't know. That's not the, well, obviously, it was passing comments. I'm not trying to judge these women and their entire existence before the Lord by any means. But a negative mindset caused by COVID or anything else is not from God in any way, shape, or form. And God didn't design us to live a mediocre life where being alive is enough. And I see that a lot. It's not just with non-Christians. Obviously, they don't have the hope that we have in Jesus. But you know what saddens me most is when I see Christians with the same mediocre life. Because there is such freedom and such joy and such hope that we can have through our relationship with Jesus. And I'm just as, I fall for it too. I'm not stood up here going, I have this amazing life where everything's wonderful and I never have a bad moment. <laughs> Far from the truth. If you were here 10 minutes before you all walked in, you would have seen me having not a very good moment where I was like, I've just finished my third and I'm exhausted and I'm really hot and everything's just too much. And I can't believe I just said that on Facebook. Yes, okay. Uh, really interesting. Okay. <laughs> So for the last couple of years that we were living in California, a bit of a segue, but it all makes sense. I had a job with a tech company called Stitch Fix, and they were a fashion styling tech company. If you want to know more about it, you can talk to me later. Um, and on a feature wall in their headquarters in their San Francisco office, they had a statement that said this, be your best self. And it was in huge letters on the wall. It wasn't just a piece of art or words to inspire but a value that the company held, which they wanted to instill in all their employees as well as their clients. 
And as a stylist, one of my jobs was to encourage my clients to dress to become their best self. <laughs> we can discuss that later too if you want. <laughs> and we as employees were challenged and given the opportunity to do the same in a variety of different ways. And I will say they really did do that. You could tell it was a company value. You could tell it was a core value that they held. But it used to make me feel really uncomfortable. I actually hated it. People used to take photos by the wall and be like, ah, be your best self. And I was like, oh, that's so missing the point in my completely judgmental attitude. It felt like a self-love, self-help, millennial feel-good mantra, which has been overused. And I felt like it was encouraging us to be really self-absorbed. I always felt like those who believed it were missing out on so much more. And that's the life they could have with Jesus. I want a Jesus absorbed life. There's a cheesy phrase for you, <laughs> but it's true. I do, I want a Jesus absorbed life. And that's been something I've been passionate about for many years, the life that we can have in and through Jesus Christ. And today I wanna to help us make sure we're being our best selves and that we're living our best life according to God, not according to anything else. So I used to think, this is a little ties in with the sermon from last week about different cultures. I used to think that statements like, be your best self, was a very American thing. Todd Tom doesn't know about this bit. <laughs> you know the kind of thing I'm talking about. You've all said it yourselves, those phrases that Americans say, the happy-go-lucky, gregarious, overly passionate and expressive, believing anything is possible attitude, I can live the American dream, I can be anything that I want to be. And let's face it, us Brits, on the other hand, tend to be a little bit more reserved, and let's face it, a little snotty. And we tend to look down on that attitude because at the core of it, let's face it, we believe we're somewhat superior. And a little bit more enlightened. And that attitude is quite immature, the attitude of the Americans, and of someone who really doesn't understand how the world works because, you know, the world is hard and difficult. And it wasn't like that in the war, you know. <laughs> You can fill in the blanks. But I want to reclaim the statement, be your best self, by adding in Christ. We talk a lot in the nation about cultivating a kingdom culture or a Christian culture. We talk about it not just here, but all around the world. We've preached about it in India, and we've preached about it in Uganda, and, we've pre and Todd's preached about it in South Sudan. Because yes, we can learn great things from observing and studying other cultures, but we should never want to be like them. What we should want is to be like a God culture, the Christian kingdom culture. And that's what we encourage people to do. The brilliant African example is they're like, we want a keyboard so we can worship like you do. We want to worship like you do in your churches. We want the big guitars and the amps and the speakers and the da da da. You know, we want it all. And we're like, why? Your worship's beautiful. Yeah, it's different. And yeah, you know, you might have fudged it together with some empty bottles and some beans, but man, it makes a great noise. And there's a passion behind it when you worship. That, you know, a keyboard and a guitar and the best sound system in the world ain't going to bring if you haven't got the passion. Our culture that we live in and that we're born into is where God has us. It's where he placed us and where we need to understand the good and bad about that culture. But what re God really wants for us is to develop a kingdom culture using the Bible as a roadmap and the Holy Spirit as our compass. So how do we do that? Let's take a look at some of the scriptures. So in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, again, I'm using the message and the Passion Translation. I'm going to read it in both translations. Um, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. 
And the Passion Translation says, Are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Come to me. I will refresh your life, for I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways and you'll discover that I'm gentle, humble and easy to please. That's something we don't often think of God. You'll find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. This scripture here is really key. If COVID or anything else has got you down, feeling beaten, overwhelmed, then go to God. If you feel even a fraction like the women on the bus, get away with him and be refreshed. Allow God to recover your life. To restore your life. Who doesn't want to live freely and lightly? I read that and I'm like, oh, please, <laughs> let me live freely and lightly. Because this is the life that God has planned for us. I know it's certainly not the life I'm living. I have moments where I feel like that in certain areas of my life. And I've got a lot of peace and rest in those areas. And I know that I've worked through those issues with God. And now I'm in a better place with him. However, there's so many areas of my life where I feel a deep burden and a heavy weight and I'm carrying and it gets overwhelming very easy and quickly and it's exhausting. I was there earlier this week. In fact, when I thought about it, on the Friday that was going into town on the park and ride bus, that's exactly how I was feeling. And I was praying because I was so overwhelmed and I was so burdened and I was carrying something that I knew is not mine to carry. But it's an area that really triggers me and gets me really overwhelmed and really freaked out and I start to panic and have anxiety about it. And it's an age old thing. We've been here before and we'll be here again, I'm sure. And my prayer is actually as I was driving to the park and ride was, God, you need to change this. This needs to change. I can't do this this way anymore. I don't want to do it, but I do it and I pick it up every time and I don't want to do it. So please don't hear that I am sat here, I know, I know lots of you know me well, know that I am not here going, I have it all together, I have all my ducks in a row. Absolutely far from it. And I do have really bad allergies, so my eyes are really watering. <laughs> this promise in Matthew that we just read brings such refreshment to me. I'm not there yet, and I'm not fully sure how to get there, but it gives me hope, and that's what I'm hanging on to. Sort my papers out over here. So I want to do a really brief segue here, because I think, I think it's important. There's a widely held view in Christianity that I do want to touch on. And it's the belief that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour... We're saved and we're given the gift of eternal life in heaven with God. And that is when the real living begins in heaven. And in the meantime, we're stuck on earth, biding our time, trudging through a life of pain, turmoil, hardship and persecution because it's a fallen world full of imperfect fallen people. And all the good stuff only comes when we get to heaven. When I was researching this last night, literally they were the articles that were coming up. You put living your best life now, which is a very cheesy Joel Osteen overused phrase, and book. That was the quote. It was like, but this is not what the Bible says. The Bible says we're going to be in persecution and it's going to be difficult. And, and all of that is true. But that is not what we believe at NNCS. And I'm not saying we don't believe that bit of the Bible. But I believe that there's a lie of the enemy to hold us back from the life that God has destined for us and planned for us and created us to be here on earth. Yes, our ultimate joy, healing, completion and peace will not come until we are with him in heaven. Absolutely. Because we are fallen, broken people who will make mistakes, who will get it wrong, who aren't fully redeemed. We can't be. But he created us to be in relationship with him and to be his hands and feet here on earth. We are his plan. Jesus died on the cross for us for a reason. Not just so we can all have a big party in heaven. Do you think that we'd be here if that was the case? What would be the point? 
yes, maybe converting some other people, but really God could have found other ways to do that if he wanted to. There is a purpose that we are here. We are here to do the work he sets out for us, to manifest his presence and his glory through the power of the Holy Spirit. And there are so many scriptures that back this up. This isn't just a Ruth and Todd going, oh, this sounds like a really nice idea. It doesn't sound like that. A much better life than the whole persecution, hell and damnation, and everything's terrible for us Christians thing. So we're going to look at some of those scriptures that back that up. We're not just holding out on hope for something a little bit nicer. In John chapter 10, verses 9 to 11, it says this. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So here it talks very clearly. He's the way to be saved, absolutely. But then it says, they will come in and go out and find pasture. So there's more to the salvation than just the glorious redemption in heaven. And yes, the thief comes to steal, steal, kill and destroy. The enemy's here, he's at large, he's present. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, again, a very well-known verse. I'm reading it from the NIV version. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This scripture from Hebrews cannot exist alongside a mindset that says, well, I'm alive, so I guess that's something. You can't hold those two schools of thought. And I'm not suggesting anybody here does, but if that defeated beaten down attitude is something that you struggle with in any way shape or form even if it's a fleeting thought remember this scripture in hebrews remember the similar scriptures around it we need to throw off everything that hinders we need to resist the lies of the enemy by not listening to him by not entertaining him and by standing up to him with the authority we have through the holy spirit And one example that we're seeing right now is that we need to weigh up all the information we're hearing about COVID. We need to consider the source, the narrative driving the source, the agenda behind it and the context. Over the past 18 months, we've been conditioned by the government and the media that a high level of positive COVID tests across the country has dire consequences. In the past, it has sent us into three national lockdowns. Then we were promised the vaccine, which would change everything. And now we're wrestling with the reality of high levels of positive COVID test results and high vaccination doses. And the population struggling to process it all. How do you process those two seemingly conflicting bits of information? COVID comes with a risk. It always has. But everything in life comes with a degree of risk. But we've been conditioned to believe that COVID is a bigger risk than many other things, which is just not true. I know how serious COVID is, that's why I very clearly set out what I think about it at the beginning. But we do have to weigh up all the information. If you're more scared of COVID than you are of anything else, then you're believing a lie of the enemy. And he has got his way and he's managing to hold you in a place of captivity, which Jesus died on the cross to set you free from. And that's what I felt with those women. You could hear that they'd been influenced by, I don't know whether it's the people around them, the media, the government, the culture, 
friends and family. I mean, I have no idea. I don't know these people. I will probably never see them again. But it had got them down. It had beaten them down to the point where you'd say, well, I'm alive, I guess that's something. And it doesn't mean that we should just have faith in God and carry on regardless of the consequences of our actions to the health and well-being of ourselves or those around us. But we cannot and should not align our thinking with that of the enemy. We have to align it with God through the Holy Spirit. And so I'm using Hove's example, but you can insert wherever example you want. You have to pray about it. You have to use the Bible and the wisdom of other Christians around you. You have to have conversations with God and with others. And you have to weigh up what's the best decision for you in those circumstances, in whatever situation, circumstances it is. But you have to throw off everything that hinders. Don't hold on to that thing that's hindering you. If it's a mindset, if it's an attitude, if it's a thought process. Today it might be COVID, tomorrow it could be something else. We have to separate ourselves from the thing, the thought, the people, etc. that hinders us. And not partner with the life and the enemy, which is the sin that so easily entangles us. We must identify and recognise where the enemy is at work and how he manifests himself so that we're able to rebuke him and have authority over him and put him in his correct place. That's how the enemy has the most power, is he sneaks up. He's a sneaky little sucker. <laughs> he gets in and he hides and he masquerades and he pretends and he's very subtle. And before you know it, he's completely trying to overpower your life and he won't overpower it because Jesus has already overpowered him but he'll have a really good go so I'm going to use an example here from the gospel of Matthew and you might think it's a bit of a strange example but it will make sense hopefully or at least it makes sense to me so hopefully I can communicate it well enough in Matthew chapter 17 verses 14 to 21 I'm reading this out of the passion translation um, because it keeps in one specific verse at the end which many current newer translations don't keep in um for a variety of reasons um but this and the new king james um those versions keep this in so it says this they came to where a large crowd had gathered to wait for jesus a man came and knelt before him and said lord please show your tender mercy towards my son he has a demon who afflicts him he has epilepsy and he suffers horribly from seizures he often falls into the cooking fire or into the river I brought him to your followers, but they weren't able to heal him, Jesus, heal him. Jesus replied, where is your faith? Can't you see how wayward and wrong this generation is? How much longer do I stay with you and put up with your doubts? Bring your son to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was instantly healed. Later, the disciples came to him privately and asked, why couldn't we cast out the demon? He told them it was because of your lack of faith. I promise you, if you have faith inside of you, no bigger than the size of a small mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move away from here and go over there and you will see it move. There is nothing you couldn't do. But this kind is cast out only through prayer and fasting. So there's so much we could unpack here. We could probably do an entire sermon series on it, to be perfectly honest, which we won't. I'm not going to be here for the next three hours. You're okay. But I want to focus on a couple of sections. Firstly, Jesus understood the kind of demon he was dealing with, which is exactly what we need to do. He knew what he was dealing with and how to get rid of it. And it's that last verse where it says this kind is cast out only through prayer and fasting. That is where the scholars who put together the versions of the Bible sort of disagree as to whether that is a crucial part or not. And when Todd and I were talking about it, I said, but hold on, Jesus didn't pray and fast before. It doesn't seem like it. He just seems like he immediately did it. This is a bit of a segue. And the argument is that Jesus was prayed up and essentially lived a fasted lifestyle and regular had, regularly had seasons. You know, we read it in the Gospels where he took himself away between meetings, between gatherings, between events, whatever it is. He took himself away to a quiet place and he prayed and he spent time with the Lord. And we 
can I guess safely assume that he wasn't eating in that talked about food they talked about food they quite happily talked about when they ate together and when they didn't so Jesus was prayed up for lack of a better phrase he lived a fasted lifestyle he had he was he regularly built that into his lifestyle so therefore he was able to deal directly with that demon we need to be able to do the same I believe we need to ask God to show us how. So when you're feeling low and overwhelmed, ask God to show you exactly what the root of it is. Then rebuke it, pray and ask God to remove it from your life or help you to deal with it. And that was my prayer on the Friday morning when I was feeling completely overwhelmed. It was like it suddenly struck me and I changed my prayer. I was like, God, you need to either get rid of this or you need to show me how to deal with it. Because I can only deal with one or the other. I can't deal with this crap in the middle. But I also think that this scripture gives us quite an interesting insight into Jesus' character. Now, this could be a bit controversial, but, you know, I'm going to say it anyway, because I felt like it when I, was, when I was researching it. I felt like this was very key. It seems like Jesus is actually quite frustrated with the father in the story not his father, with the father in the story, as well as the disciples. He seems almost irritated and agitated and frustrated by them. And we know to some degree that he had some of those characteristics because he demonstrated them at other times, namely when he overturned the tables in the temple, when they were trading on the Sabbath. I think it's the same, possible that he feels the same way about us when we lack faith, when we forget who he is and what he's able to do. However, I think Jesus is so desperate for the disciples to understand the power and authority they can and do have that when they forget or don't exercise their authority, he gets frustrated. But he does not give up on them. And the scripture is very clear. He actually encourages them and shows them how to do it again. And he does exactly the same with us. And that's different. Our culture tells us if we don't get it right, that those around us just get a bit annoyed and a bit frustrated and a bit irritated. And eventually, you know, if we keep not doing it well enough enough, they'll eventually give up on us. That's what our cultures dictate. And that can be pretty much any culture. <laughs> it's human existence. Our fuses can be quite short. But Jesus never gives up on his disciples and he never gives up on us. And God doesn't either. Through his Holy Spirit, he walks alongside us through the same situations over and over again, if necessary. And he teaches us, guides us and instructs us and helps us until we get it right. Because he wants us to thrive in that area. And I think it's almost like I could just imagine going, oh, for goodness sake. When the disciples are like, why couldn't we do it? <laughs> I love the disciples, their ace. You know, why couldn't we do it? And he's like, you just have not enough faith. I've told you how many times you only need a tiny little bit. And I remember a great sermon a while ago, it was a few years ago now, and somebody actually preached on this and gave out mustard seeds. And it's, you know, it's not a new idea, it's been done before. But when you see the size of a mustard seed itself, it's like, it's like a poppy seed. It's like the smallest seed you've ever seen, almost. And then it says, if you have, what does it say? If you have a, oh, put me paper down now, that's no good, is it? No bigger than the size of a small mustard seed, this version says. That's the amount of faith we need. I probably have that much. <laughs> I just need to apply it to every area of my life. In the Passion Translation, it has these notes that accompany the scriptures, and it said this, Jesus compares faith to a small seed that grows into a large shrub. Faith will grow as it feeds on spiritual truth found in the Bible. And that a mountain can also be a symbol of a kingdom. Mountain-moving faith brings the power of God's kingdom to earth. And we have that mountain moving faith. I would say that nobody in this space or probably watching online today doesn't have faith the size of a small mustard seed. 
but do we realize that that's all it takes to move the mountain so whatever that mountain is that's in front of you whatever that thing is that's so big that gets you down that overwhelms you that overcomes you in whatever moment and however fleeting or lasting that might be you have enough faith to move it but you need to believe it we need to believe it we need to grow our faith it's a continual development and ongoing process so i want to read if you can find it i'm really gonna have to think through this whole paper thing in wind as well just <laughs> extra challenges I'm going to read that Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So let's not grow weary and lose heart. Don't let COVID overcome you or get to you. Don't let fear, anxiety, other people, situations you're in, circumstances you're in, circumstances that might come and go don't let them let you grow weary and lose heart because jesus has overcome the world he's overcome it all and he wants us to live in that level of freedom here and now on earth so that we are equipped and ready to do the work he has set before us I wanted to read some of the lyrics of that song. Todd had told me which songs he picked, um, but I wasn't actually able to look at the lyrics um, as he was saying it. And that last song, Ruins, I absolutely love it. It's not the happiest sounding song <laughs> in, its, in its tones and its tune, but the lyrics are just, I think, astonishing. When it says, hopelessness is starting to wreak havoc. This is a, very, very, ugh, a relatively new song. It was only written a few months ago, as far as I know. It was written in America, but it is obviously, you know, the COVID pandemic's international. And I do believe that there's part of this. I don't know. I don't know the story behind the song, but hopelessness is starting to wreak havoc. That's what I heard on the bus. That was the hopelessness I heard. And it is, it's wreaking havoc on our society. It's wreaking havoc around the world. But let's remember, it says, you rebuild, you restore all that's broken from the ruins. You redeem, you return all that's stolen from your children. That's what you do. So now we're going to play um, a song just to give a chance to reflect. And um, it's a song called The Blessing, which if anything like uh, you all be familiar with it because it was around and has been around for quite a few years now. But um, it became the anthem of the pandemic this time last year, probably around Easter. I think it was when it was really big. Um, and there was a UK version of The Blessing done by a variety of worship leaders um, and musicians from around the UK. And that's the version we're going to play. And I really want you to reflect on it. But the beauty of this is that it's scripture. It's God's word completely put into song and sung over you. So I really want you to just spend some time. We've put the lyrics in here more so that you can see them and so that you can take it with you and read them over yourself. You can play the song if you want, or you can just read it, or you can pick it up from scripture. Um, and I'm just going to pray this over us now. So Lord Jesus, we do thank you that you died on the cross for our salvation, for our freedom. So that we could experience complete freedom from the sin that so easily entangles us. And we pray that the Lord may bless us and keep us. Make his face shine upon us 
and be gracious to us. The Lord will turn his face to us and give us peace. Amen.